Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fired Up, the podcast for marketers working in early and late stage startups. I'm Morgan McClintic, the CEO of startup marketing agency Firebrand. We've launched this podcast to interview the best in the business, but I'm not going to do it alone. So please meet my co hosts. I'm Nicole Pytel, Firebrand's VP of Content Marketing. And I'm Chris Ulbricht, Firebrand's Head of Media Relations. I'm Ian Lipner, a tech PR and crisis communications veteran. We'll drop a new episode each week, so there's plenty of fuel for your marketing fire. Get the spark you need to take your startup to a whole new level. Hello there, and welcome to another edition of Fired Up. Today, we are going to be talking about how to announce funding. Here we are as we enter H2 2024. Things have changed. Funding is picking up. So we gathered the gang to talk about it. So I'm joined today by Ian Lipner. Hey, Ian. How are you doing? Hey, Morgan. How's it going today? It's going super well. And Chris Albrick. Hello. Glad to be here. My sense is that funding is picking up. And so I just quickly looked on Crunchbase here. Global startup funding picked up in the second quarter, reaching $79 billion. That's a raise of 16% quarter over a quarter and 12% on the $71 billion invested in Q2 2023. So it's up. Mostly it's sort of mega rounds, over $100 million. And a lot of it's into AI, as you would expect. But, you know, the general trend, though, is we're still down from the peak in Q4 2021. You know, we had way over 175, it looks like, billion there. And, and here we are down at sort of 79 billion. The breakdown is, look, seed uh, and early stage are still fairly flat. And so I think slightly skewed this time by because. XAI got a Series B of six billion, and that's pretty unusual. But from the clients we're working with, there's been an uptick in the number of funding announcements that we're working with in the companies we talk to. And I, my sense is that people are getting back out there and deals are getting done. And we'll start to see that later in the data. So, what we thought we'd do is just talk about all right. The world is slightly different today as companies think about announcing their funding than it was back before. And we've been in the doldrums for the last sort of 18, 24 months, largely when it comes to funding. So as we sort of blink into this new era, what has changed? So let's talk about that because things have changed. But before we do that, Chris, maybe you could just give us a little overview of the funding announcement process in general. I think the first thing to understand about the funding process is that there's a lot more to it than might at first meet the eye. If you're coming into it, especially for the first or second time, it might seem to be little more than the matter of drafting a quick press release with the bare facts and figures and pitching it out to the media on the day that you come out with the news. Now, it's entirely possible to put out an announcement like that, but you are not likely to get the optimal results if you just shove news out over the transom in that way. So typically, if we're talking about timeline, you want to get started anywhere uh, from six weeks to eight weeks ahead of an announcement. That might seem like an insanely long time to get your act together. But there are a lot of things you have to consider here. Number one, often our clients are pairing up a funding announcement with some kind of web uh, overhaul, website overhaul. So right from the get-go, you have all of those contingencies to worry about. And as anyone who's dealt with a big web project knows, they tend to slip. So you want to start thinking about this well ahead if there's any kind of website you know or other sort of internal contingency or like a rebrand or that kind of thing that you're that you're working on but even if you're not involved in that you want to get a real head start here because as part of its nature a funding announcement to the media is a way to check in with your corporate progress a lot of reporters who specialize in funding news, I mean, everyone's different. Everyone has their own take. But 
overall, I think you would, you would find a lot of reporters who specialize in funding who treat it as a sort of a news hook for your corporates for covering a, a, a startup's corporate story. And as such, it's often a moment where a business will take stock of its corporate messaging, the story it tells about itself. And the story you're telling about yourself today might not be the same you were telling a year ago, two years ago. You might uh, have pivoted to a different market. You might have expanded your product line. You might have expanded internationally. Uh, you might have added new products to your catalog. And then uh, you may also be adapting to larger market forces like AI. Everybody at this point feels like they need to have some kind of messaging that dovetails with AI, whether it is part of their own product strategy or more rarely positioning against the general trend. But one way or another, you can't ignore it. So you're going to have to get your messaging together. Uh, and this can be a, pro a process that, that can take anywhere from one to four weeks, depending on how many stakeholders there are, how fast you move, and how much of, a, of an overhaul you need to do. You, of course, need to draft your press release This to, to make sure that there's time for all stakeholder approvals. You probably want to give yourself a couple of weeks for that, maybe one week for you know a few days for drafting it, a couple of days for internal approvals, and then a week for any partner, customer, analyst approvals if you're if you're quoting outsiders in in your release you're going to want to get your your backers on board if you possibly can whether that's a, your vc firm your pe firm you need to understand whether they will participate they'll usually give you a quote but will they talk to media if so you know what messages are they willing to put forward usually you're you're going to want to draft some material if you expect to get them on the line with a reporter you're going to want to draft some some talking points for them just to make sure that they're synced up with the messages you're trying to promote in your in your own PR. And then there's the pitching itself. And we'll talk more about this, I think, later on. But in the crazy heyday a couple of years back of funding news, there were reporters at publications like TechCrunch that were telling us that they were basically booking out three or four weeks ahead. And if you were pitching them Inside of that window, they were just fully booked. They couldn't take your news. Now, of course, they'd always make room for a, you know, an industry giant or one of the nine or 10 Bigfoot style startups that make news every time they roll over in bed. But for your average startup, you kind of needed to give yourself like a three or four week window in certain verticals. Now, again, we'll talk more about this in a bit, but at this point, we're saying that for pitching your news, two weeks is what you need to allocate at minimum. Um, and there are nuances to that depending on whether you're following an exclusive strategy or a go-wide embargo strategy. I don't want to anticipate that part of the conversation. But just think to yourself, yeah, I need to allocate at least two weeks to pitching it to secure a reasonably detailed feature story in a publication that matters to me. So if you put it all together, you know, you're looking at about a six to eight week process if you're doing it right and you're not scrambling at the last minute. That always surprises people, right? But when you work through it, they're like, oh, okay, actually the components of it. And you want to get it right. And so, you know, moving the schedule around is often important. And you're right. If you're coming out of stealth, then the website, obviously, and, you know, you're going to get more traffic on, on the day. So even if you're not building a new website or redoing messaging, what conversion events are you doing so that you can kind of harness that that traffic? Ian, Chris just mentioned an exclusive. You talked a bit about pitching under embargo. I feel like people get these confused. Just Can you just explain what we mean about that and the whole go-wide strategy? You know, like Chris said, you're a few weeks out. It's time to start considering how you're going to go out to media and who's going to be most interested in your news. And you sort of have to kind of decide, am I going to employ an exclusive strategy? That is, only let one journalist take a full look at the news, look at your press release, maybe get a chance to interview, hopefully get a chance to interview your executives and hope for a, a deeper, 
fuller story that you know will come out timed with the press release itself, the announcement itself. And the upside of that is you're, you know, you've got that lined up in advance. You know that um, there will definitely be a story. And you're usually going to a pretty prominent media source, somebody at one of your top publications. And depending usually on the novelty of your you know, announcement, should you be coming out of stealth if you're a new kind of company, or frankly, the size of your deal tends to dictate your choices, both on whether to go with an exclusive and who to go uh, with an exclusive. There are some journalists who are only going to look at triple digit deals, you know, huge unicorn like valuations. There are others who, you know, are more interested in what's unique about it, you know, what's being disrupted, why is this important from a technology point of view or individual market point of view. So, you know, with an exclusive, again, only one journalist gets to see this news. Once the news is out, you're going wide at that point. As soon as that crosses the wire, it's, you know, free for all. And you're hoping that the prominence of that exclusive publication will drive a certain amount of awareness, even among the journalist community. And they'll feel, hey, this is significant enough. I have to announce this within my vertical market or within, you know, certainly the tech areas that apply. But there's also the point of view in some cases that, hey, that's going to limit if you don't necessarily have a guarantee of a very, very prominent publication. It's going to limit the total, you know, number of people who might be interested in running a slightly longer story, right? I'll get the the follow on, hey, this happened, you know, that kind of coverage, but maybe I won't get a couple more paragraphs from a few more people. So there are reasons that, you know, some folks will go with just simply an embargoed strategy, right? Where they're going out to a number of journalists in advance and, you know, hoping to get a little bit more coverage. Maybe the story itself just doesn't have that juice that's needed to like really drive an exclusive. Like, frankly, maybe the journalists aren't like, hey, that doesn't sound special enough to me to kind of position it that way. So, you know, usually when that's the case, it's because maybe you're the, the fifth entrant into your market or you're, 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 the amount of money that you're talking about is less than those who have sort of driven that path before. You know, there are other reasons. It could be timing in the targets that you're working with. You know, right now we're in the middle of the summer. There are fewer people kind of answering every email. Sometimes that target that really seems like the right person for you, they're going to be out of the office for the next three weeks and your announcement is coming anyway. So all those things might play in. I mean, just to answer the question most succinctly, an exclusive is exclusive to one journalist and one publication. <laughs> and embargoed news... When we're talking about funding news, journalists, of course, respect the embargo, uh, understand why you've put it in place. I think in a lot of cases, people are pitching news that isn't funding news and shouldn't be embargoed. And the journalist is like, okay, yeah, thanks for uh, making this a very official process around this, but I will respect your embargo if I even pick it up. So, you know, clearly you want to have those agreements with the journalists in place because, you know, you're talking about releasing news in an orderly fashion. You you don't want one journalist to feel usurped, so on and so forth. And of course, there's there's also uh, legal ramifications for doing it the wrong way. Right. And, you know, just to underline, I mean, the principle behind an embargo is, you know, that it's an agreement between you and the reporter that they're not going to publish the new. You're going to give them news in advance. They agree to but not to publish it until a certain date and time. And these agreements are standard in media, PR, relations, any halfway experienced reporter knows what to do with them, knows how to work with them. It's a classic gripe of reporters that they receive news, which is under embargo. And I mean, it's sent to them under embargo without having previously, without the PR previously having secured their agreement to take the news under embargo. We always say about where we're talking about embargoes is that a journalist's job is often described as reporting what they know as soon as possible after they know it, you know, assuming it's newsworthy. So an embargo is a special exception to that rule. And as a rule, you always need to, to seek uh, advance 
approval from the person you're pitching the embargo to before sharing anything you wouldn't want to see in print. Because technically, if you do that, they have every right to go ahead and publish what you've, what you've sent them. That is a lot rarer these days than it used to be. There were reporters who would TechCrunch famously just announced years and years ago, back in the Mike Arrington days, they just announced, but they weren't doing embargoes anymore. And anyone who sent information to them under embargo, they would just publish it right away. The Wall Street Journal also had a no embargo policy for a short time, though they've relented since then. But the basic rule, just want to make clear, all our listeners understand that the basic rule is that you secure agreement from the reporter before you send them anything under embargo. It seems like, you know, obvious to me that you wouldn't call a friend up and say, here's a secret. Hey, do you want to know a secret afterward? <laughs> but but we've we've seen some mistakes even in recent times. Right. And you're referring to Alex Conrad tweeting out just last week that he'd received a $456 million deal without agreeing to the embargo and he was straining at the leash to 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 announce who that was we all now know who that was you can just google 456 million was going to come out on the 14th of august well right and i mean the joke there really is that i mean granted with a 400 something million dollar round you could argue that alex conrad covering it might not be their ideal outcome but that's a pretty good outcome and I, I mean, I think most PR people have at one point joked that they, you know, were going to try to get coverage for some announcement by sending it without approval under embargo in the hopes that that reporter would cover it. I mean, honestly, and if he had gone ahead and published it, it might have caused them all sorts of problems. But, uh, you know, a feature story from, Alex Conrad would not be one of if them. If it had been a story, yeah. yeah. If it had just been a tweet, I think that might have been disappointing. Yeah, well, exactly. That's the thing. The The real way to mess with a company like that would be to tweet it out and not and not write it up. Yeah. It's 140 characters and it's done. Totally. Let's talk a little bit about the history of funding so that we can provide some context of the world in which we're sort of operating today. Let's go back. After the Great Recession, and look, there was loads of funding, obviously, dot com, all that kind of stuff before that. But let's sort of, you know, for most people to try and think after the Great Recession, I think there was a great period, 2010 up to 2020 of funding news where you could pretty much count on getting, what, 10, mm -hmm. 15 pieces mm -hmm. of coverage from your announcement and you would have to be careful about how you did that, but you, you would get a lot of, you know, a lot of news from your funding. And, and actually, that was pretty much the engine room of a lot of startups' coverage in total, getting the funding news. I would say that was the heyday of it. There was a lot of trade press, a lot of people covering. But then you went, we went into the ZERP period, zero interest rate period after the pandemic, Around the pandemic, obviously, everybody thought, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen with funding? How are you going to do any deals? And then actually everyone realized, oh, we can do a lot of deals. And you had this whole zero-day close trend. And there was just a ton of funding, a deluge, 2020 to 2022. I think the peak is in uh, Q1 2022. Tons of funding. Chris, there were periods where we just had one or two on all the time. Like there was always funding. It's true. Some plane coming into land. What was that? period? Like, how would you describe that period? The two periods you described really are distinct in that they were both busy times for funding, but for different reasons. You're doing, uh, like the PR looked very different. And one of the reasons for that is the difference between what the media landscape looked like mm -hmm. in the ZERP period versus the post-2008 period. So in that earlier period, while the contraction in the tech trade media, and just for those following along at home, we are a tech uh, firm focused on tech startups. So, you know, our view of this is totally tech focused. But in that earlier period, the contraction in the tech media had begun, but there was still a fairly healthy ecosystem of tech 
news based publications. You, you had not yet seen the move, which is fully in evidence today, uh, toward SEO based evergreen content. Tech trade still covered breaking news, and that included funding news. So there were a lot of desirable publications to pitch if you were a tech startup, even beyond the VC-oriented press. So, of course, you had TechCrunch, VentureBeat, Business Insider, but you also had, you know, IDG News, and you had the channel partner publications, and you had even vertical publications like Network World, that sort of thing. Now, obviously, that's an IDG publication, so there's some overlap there. But point being, you had a lot of options. Internet news was still a thing. Mm. You know, the embargo strategy made a lot more sense back in that period because you had a lot more publications to pitch. You were missing out on a lot more substantial clips if you went with an exclusive than if you if you went with uh, an embargo. So I would say that by and large, most of the funding announcements that I worked on back in the day were embargo-based. And I think there was even a sort of suspicion among journalists that if you were offering them funding news on an exclusive basis, that there was something wrong with it. It would have to be a pretty impressive round to to sort of evade that suspicion. On the other hand, an exclusive has a sort of natural appeal to a journalist because it means no competitor has it. And even at that time, publications like TechCrunch were thinking about clicks. And if you have the story and nobody else does, even for a few hours, it means you're going to get the majority of the clicks. So an exclusive did hold some appeal, but I think it had a, a little bit of a different flavor back then when you had so many other options. And I think most startups and startup PR people tended to try to take advantage of those options. Now, you transition to the ZERP period, and by then, the tech media had utterly collapsed. And what was left of it was and is mainly subsisting on evergreen content. They really cut back on breaking news coverage, including funding coverage. They do very much less sort of horse race coverage of who's up in a certain sector, um, whether that be biotech or or network tech or fintech. The trades are less. You, you find a lot fewer trades who do that sort of coverage. That's the kind of coverage funding fits into. So during that period, the challenge for startups and for PR was just keeping up with the pace of the funding. We had one we had one client that did three rounds in a year, maybe not a calendar year, but like in 365 days. They had three substantial funding rounds and culminating in with stories in Forbes and the Wall Street Journal. So it was really the, the pace of the news as opposed to the breadth of the pitching you did around each announcement. And because there were so many fewer publications to pitch in that period, the exclusive to TechCrunch made a lot more sense. At that point, VentureBeat had really narrowed its focus. I think uh, like you were already starting to see the retrenchment around AI that is now fully evident at VentureBeat. TechCrunch was one of the last full-spectrum publications still covering funding news. This is when you needed to to book certain reporters four or five weeks out. Yeah. So, you know, there I would say that the, the tactics shifted more toward the exclusive, but that went along with a dramatic narrowing of the scope of the, the potential uh, targets. Now, uh, there are no doubt about it. There are ways to level up to a Forbes, to a Fortune, to a Wall Street Journal. But those strategies also tended to be exclusive-based. In fact, Fortune's uh, writer, uh, Porter for Term Sheet, just you know, mentioned recently that for her to do feature coverage, it must be an exclusive, no questions asked. Right. So we're in that ZERP period, and it was a frenzy for the reporters. There were four fewer outlets, so you went with the exclusive, and you had to, you know, it made the time frame longer. And then we moved into what are we going to call it? The HERP higher interest rate period. 
like 2023, like to where we are now, I'm not going to say high interest rate, because we're not up at the 14%. But, you know, it cooled down. There were fewer deals. You can just see it from the crunch base data from Q2 2022, which sort of dropped down. So we're still, well, then ab- above 100 billion. And since then, Q3 2022, we've been below 100 billion globally all the way through to, to where we are now, Q2 2024, the latest data. So it's still down, but we're starting to sort of lift up. And, that, and then there were, so there were fewer deals announced. So I, I, like the time frame, you needed to get on the dance card of the reporters. It took a little less time, right, to get onto it, but still two weeks. And this is where we're emerging into now. There's less competition. There's still not as many outlets. But now more companies are starting to want to make their announcements. So let's just talk about that today. When we are announcing things currently in, like, what are we seeing? How, what are you seeing as a difference between the boom with the ZERP and now where we are having, you know, we're probably on the tail end of that sort of HERP period. Yeah, I think we did see sort of, okay, there's more room for your announcement. The amount of it became less of the determining factor as we proceeded through 2003. And then, you know, at the same time, we're starting to see an alignment there with where is the funding along with, you know, how are these media structured, right? Uh, the, the interest in AI, you know, that the media showed and sort of kind of started leaning toward in their coverage, whether you're, you're talking about a venture beat or others, starting to kind of meet where the funding is starting to go here now in 2024. Like Chris said, every, you know, got to have an AI note in there. Maybe part of that was to achieve coverage, but part of it to achieve funding. So there's more you know, there's more and more announcements about AI. And I think now we're starting to get to the point where, okay, there's there's been one about AI and a new company in nearly every niche, right? And I think we can anticipate a little bit more scrutiny of like, okay, all right, you have an LLM that does X isn't enough, right? And now it's going to take another look at, okay, what, what are your differences, your competitive advantages and and that number again you know you know that's going to start driving more of those decisions in terms of the timing and how much time journalists want you know i think they always want as much as possible right now it's we're in the middle of the summer so we're, you know we're kind of playing that game of of sort of uh pinging and finding them and figuring out when they're in and out and all that you know i think we can anticipate that based on what we've seen in terms of inquiries that as we get toward the fall, we're going to see another increase and in sort of flood of this and, you know, need to stretch out that timeline again, especially if interest rates, you know, spur, you know, another seed round bloom, if you will. So in terms of targets, they're not growing. They're not growing in number, right? So um, the interest in AI aside, you know, I, I do think it remains a competitive process. and following the the sort of order of operations that we've talked about is important because you're not going to be able to go, oh, oh yeah, I've got an announcement coming out next week. It's got some money attached to it. Hey, journalists, you got time to write this off. That's not, it's still not going to work. You're still going to need the proper runway. Right. And I would just add like the one tweak to that, that I, it's a, sort of important to bear in mind. And it's a good problem to have uh, if you have it, is that if you're dealing with say a Bloomberg, maybe a CNBC. But if you're dealing with a publication uh, that values timeliness very, very highly, then you know we found that those reporters actually don't want to sit on news very long. So I would just say if you're pitching a Bloomberg news and reporters there um, you know have very specific requirements, uh, so this is not, it's, you're not likely to be hitting Bloomberg with your series A, but if you've gotten to the point where you're over a billion dollar valuation, you're approaching IPO and you're trying to get funding news there, be, just be prepared to move within a week, meaning to publish your news within a week of pitching the reporter because their concern is going to be getting scooped. And especially with the kind of rounds they cover, which are large, relatively visible in the valley 
gossiped about internally, um, they are more likely to leak. And at that point, the value for a publication whose proposition to its subscribers largely revolves around being first, the value of that news deteriorates a great yeah. deal, uh, maybe even completely once somebody else has it. So just to say, if you're going after a really hard breaking news organization, they really might not want the news much very far ahead. Whereas a tech crunch, depending on the reporter, might be much more willing to just take the news and slot you in some weeks in the future. Talking about news leaking, I want to talk about Form D. So for those that don't know, Form D is a notice of exemption from offering securities. It's a public document that when you have private investment from a VC or a PE firm, you have to file with the SEC or they have to file with the SEC that a transaction, a private transaction has taken place. And these documents are then available on Edgar. You can just look them up. And so it says the name of the investor, it says the name of the company, it says the amount of the transaction. And you have to file this within 15 days of the deal, of the money transferring, the deal closing. And back in the heyday, the Form D was the sort of once the deal had closed, you were on the meter and you had to make sure you made your announcement before that Form D dropped and became uh, needed to be filed and became public because there were reporters who would just literally sit on that register and then sort of PE Hub, for example, and then announce them. And so you could get sort of scooped and the information was out there. You then saw that sort of drop off for a variety of reasons. I think some, candidly, some decided not to file the Form D, although you have to file it. There were some complexities in the you know types of transactions that happened, like you know different forms of investment. If you take a safe note, maybe that's not an actual security, so you, the Form D doesn't apply. Your law firm needs to advise you about this, but from a PR perspective, there was a public declaration in this Form D it's around Reg D, that meant that that information would become public. We saw that drop away because there were fewer filings maybe and there were different types of transaction. But it, maybe now it's starting to sort of come back a little bit. There was a story around Placer AI and TechCrunch earlier that they had seen the story from a Reg D uh, filing about the transaction. I don't know whether that meant that was where they first came up with it and then they started sort of sniffing around around the story. But I do want to just say, look, this is a legal requirement and it does get things into the public domain. And so we could see a return to that being monitored. What do you think, Chris? Right. Well, as you say, there have been sort of different eras in the, in the way that the press have used Form D filings. And I think that they fall roughly into three eons. The largest of those periods, the distant past until the relatively recent uh, times, Form Ds uh, were not available online. So reporters didn't look at them. They were not driving news coverage in any kind of meaningful way. There was no practical, as far as I'm aware, there was no practical way for a reporter to sift them on a daily basis and hoping to find the one nugget that uh, would drive coverage. But then once those filings did become available online through Edgar Online Service, it's very easy to, to access. At that point, there sort of sprung up this cottage industry or this, this standard practice among venture capital reporters of keeping an eye on those filings and pulling out any that hadn't been reported and then using that as a way to, to get news scoops. But that had a sort of inevitable knock-on effect. These online filings increased transparency in the Valley, which was the intended purpose. But because companies were finding uh, their we're finding their internal funding data getting publicized at times they didn't expect, in ways they didn't expect. They were having to answer questions that they they weren't really planning to answer. They were fielding calls from reporters. They might have been gearing up to make a an announcement, and then a reporter just 
you know, as they say these days, tweeted it out from under them. It wouldn't have been tweeted at that point, but you know, it, they they were gearing up in a very organized way to announce the news, and then a, an enterprising reporter would just find it and report it in a way that didn't mesh with the startup's marketing plans, which is exactly what the press is supposed to do. But you know, startups responded predictably by finding alternatives to filing form Ds. And there are a whole range of of strategies that, you know, law firms now sort of counsel startups to use. And I, I think because we are not legal experts, we're not going to go into the details here. Obviously, the overarching advice in this whole section is consult your lawyer, yeah. right? <laughs> because there is this desire to avoid disclosure if possible, startups began either using alternative methods to report or apparently not reporting at all. And there are a number of articles, and I think I've seen at least one scholarly study that looked at compliance with, I think they were just comparing rounds that had been announced with rounds that were available, where information was available in Edgar. And there was a extremely large number of startups that just weren't filing Form Ds anymore. Now, whether that was because they weren't filing anything or because they were using alternate modes of reporting, I don't know. But the net effect of that was that it made the Form D less valuable for reporters because so few rounds were getting filed that it really wasn't worth anyone's while anymore to keep an eye regularly on filings because you were just as likely to miss a round as catch a round. So there was a moment in time when, you know, if you were a tech PR person, you really had to be on the watch for the Form D, for reporters picking up on your Form D, and you really had to keep an eagle eye on when that was filed. I would say you still need to keep an eagle eye if your client is filing a Form D, if you are the client and you're planning to file a Form D. You do have to bear in mind that whatever you put on that is going to be public knowledge once it's filed. It's going to be available in Edgar. And it's at that point, the issue is less that you are likely to have a reporter find it when you don't expect them to find it, but more that your news might look less attractive to a reporter if it's already been out there in a Form D. If a reporter starts working with you on an exclusive basis and they know that the details of the news are out there on the Form D, they have to sort of live with the possibility mm. that another reporter is going to find it and potentially scoop them. Now, the chances of that happening are lower than they were back in the absolute peak of this Form D mania, reporting mania. But it's real and it's it, it's not a point in your favor if you're trying to pitch news to a reporter, especially on an exclusive – well, actually, exclusive or an embargo. If you're trying to pitch news to a reporter and the news is already in the public record, it's much more difficult to make the pitch. It's especially difficult to pitch a bunch of reporters under embargo with details of news that are on the public record. You actually can't do that. You can't tell them, I'm putting the names and dates and the amounts under embargo because anyone can find it. You've, you've basically broken your own embargo by filing the Form D. So it's really more those logistical issues that you have to bear in mind when you're thinking about filing or you know looking for alternatives to file these days. It's really about the timing of your news, making sure that that you're you're pitching before the form D is is filed, and making sure that whatever your target date for the news is um, is as close as possible to when that news is going to become public knowledge at all. Because the currency, the value of your news, the asset that you have, lies largely in the fact that it hasn't been reported yet. And if you through your form D have reported it yourself, you are depreciating your own asset. So that's a deep dive on Form D, and it sounds obscure, but this is the, like in a practical sense. I think a lot of marketers are like, okay, I never even heard of this thing, and it's something that the attorneys are doing, but actually has a meaningful impact when we're trying to announce this news because it burns into timing and the messaging, et cetera. 
In the time we got remaining, I do want to talk about TechCrunch because, look, there are plenty of other publications late for later stage companies. You just talk about Forbes, you talk about Bloomberg that will cover funding news. But for the majority, they want to at least go through TechCrunch at some point. Every startup wants its TechCrunch story. And big things are happening at TechCrunch, right? Uh, you know, they've had a big change of report, uh, the reporting staff, you know, new editors in there. Let's just sort of frame that out a little bit. Is it still what it was? It's gone through a lot of ownership. How are we feeling about TechCrunch these days, Ian? You know, I think you've got a definite shift and you've seen a lot of faces that were stalwarts there, like slowly slide and sidle side allowed. Some of them have been a, a little bit louder than others. I think we saw John Biggs, who was one of the folks that was a little less uh, a little less subtle about the way that TechCrunch has changed. It comes down to the financial model and trying to create something that's going to drive a continual amount of revenue for them. And they've tried a bunch of different things. Chris can talk more to the to the history of it. I would say that what I've noticed is that the the folks that were driving some of their biggest properties have 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 left, right? And you got to wonder, okay, is this is this about shifting toward you know more of the the way TechCrunch used to look like, or is this about kind of shifting toward where we're looking at the evergreen SEO, making sure that the traffic that you do get is highly monetized versus making sure that there's a lot of traffic arriving. From a pitching point of view, I would say you know, got to get to know more people, got to look at who is moving around and who's coming on and what you know what are their styles of reporting where they've been in the past. You have to adjust to to pitch the, the reporters that are there, not the kind of yeah. the, the publication that was. Yeah, I mean, I think the basic experience of working with TechCrunch has been very, is very similar to how it's been over the last, I would say, probably 10 years. You know, it is still a news driven publication. It's probably as news driven today as it's ever been. TechCrunch has gone through periods where they have experimented with more analytical content, like their TechCrunch Plus, which recently got folded up, or they have experimented at times with competing more in the realm of like general consumer news, doing a lot more coverage of big tech companies like Apple product um, re reviews, that kind of thing. I feel like the focus at TechCrunch at the moment is squarely on startups. And it is the class, it's what I would think of as the classic TechCrunch experience, the one that most people associate with TechCrunch. So you know, funding news is still a, is a big part, uh, not the only part, but a big part of their coverage here and there. They're doing, you, they'll still pick up product news. Um, there was a moment during that ZERP period where it was just, it was just a, like all funding. I mean, of course it wasn't all funding, but it felt like it was all funding. Now they're back to reporting on startups in various ways, including funding, but funding is definitely still a mainstay. So I would say that they are in a relatively characteristic period at the moment. Yeah. So under Connie Lloyd's they have changed a number of their staff. I do you feel like the slightly more, I don't want to say aggressive stance to some of their reporting, like they're going to go for the story and the scoops and then they're going to be slightly less, I don't want to say pliant, but accommodating from what a, a startup might want from its marketing goals, thereafter being a news a, a news outlet, right? And they're going to go for the story. So you do see that tone coming across. And I think that's a good thing, right? I do think that, you know, you need an outlet of that stature sort of holding the companies a bit more accountable. All right, just as we uh, wrap up here, let's just think about what advice we would give and how startups today can set themselves up for success when it comes to announcing their funding in this sort of post herp period. What advice have we got? My big advice is to understand how, if this is your first funding announcement, 
treat it like your date, like your debut. You know, you are presenting yourself and your story to the world. So this is going to be more about mission and differentiation. But if you have done stories like that before, especially funding stories, be really clear going into your next funding announcement about what has changed and why that is of interest to investors, which is one of the main, you know, reader, uh, you know, audiences for this kind of news and potential users and potential um, employees. So you're retelling and revising your corporate story, but make sure you you figured out how to advance the story. Even if you you have not fundamentally changed, if your products haven't fundamentally changed, figure out a side of yourself you haven't focused on because that will give the reporter much more to work with and will increase your chances of getting a substantial story rather than a ho hum, you know, get it done in 10 minutes kind of story. Yeah, to add to that, I would say just thinking about the entire life cycle of that narrative in advance, right? And, you know, making that assumption that you're going to need to do what Chris is saying, right? Uh, a lot of folks, they, they'll they get that first story and they'll sort of rush it out the door and they don't realize that that was their big moment to build around both in advance and after for a while, right? Um, and, and we'll see folks that haven't anticipated the way that they're going to continue to to map that story for their company along with the, the uh, uh, along with its development. So keeping in mind that you know, you'll have those folks who want to tease out everything they plan on doing, you know, with that, with that financing, sure. You got to tell what, what your intentions are, but you also have to kind of leave some, some road ahead of you so that your PR team can continue to, you know, drive, drive news for the company. And Chris brought up a an instance where, you know, companies coming back and getting funded really quickly afterward, right? Uh, how are you going to kind of position that if you know, hey, we're we're doing really well here. Nine months from now, we're going to be back talking to this reporter. That should be something that you're thinking about before that first conversation. Not everybody has that potential, but when you are on that track, that's sort of these are signposts. These aren't just the only moments. I think that's great advice. I would just add, look, the funding announcement is a key milestone. Get ready for the extra traffic that's going to come to your website so you can capitalize on it. Make sure you're sort of amplifying that with your VCs and over social, taking the best advantage of it at the time. But then what comes next, right? What's the next story? Uh, What's the next, you know, then, you know, this is the starting gun. People are starting to look at you what are you going to say next to kind of build on the story? So because it can be that, hey, you get this big spike of, of coverage or, you, you know, you, this big spike of traffic, and then they hear nothing until then you pop up with your next round, your Series B. Well, you know, I've heard nothing from you. So use this as part of an ongoing program. And, you know, it can become a very intense moment and, and an exciting moment, but do sort of have an eye on what comes next. Okay. Ian, Chris, thank you very much for sharing some of your experience and insights here about what it's like doing funding today. I think it's an exciting time. Hope that was useful for everyone. And we look forward to uh, talking to you all next week. Well, that wraps it up for today. But two quick things before we go. First, we've just published our Startup Marketer Outlook, which is a report based on a survey of over 250 senior marketers, uh, early and late stage startups, all about their plans for H2 2024. So please go to firebrand.marketing and in the resources section, you'll be able to download your copy there. Second, if you've enjoyed the show, please give us a rating or a review. Obviously, subscribe. We really appreciate that since that helps others discover the show. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next week. And in the meantime, get out there and crush your marketing goals.